Hello, everyone, and welcome to Top 10 Security Practices for Protecting Your Infrastructure. Thank you for joining me today. I'm really excited to uh, get to do this talk. So my name is Mason Egger, and I'm a developer advocate at DigitalOcean. If you have any questions for me, for me um, feel free to tweet me at Mason Egger. Feel free to give me a follow. Um, and these are all my other contact informations and things like that. So the goals for this webinar are essentially um, <clears throat> to inform you of what I, Mason, the me, considers to be some of the most crucial minimal set of tasks to minimize uh, your chance of compromise. So most crucial things that you can do security wise to help minimize your chance of, you know, having something bad happen. Um, these are all my opinions based on my personal experience. Before I was an advocate, I was in site reliability engineering for a uh, Fortune 500 company. And then before that, I was actually in cybersecurity working for a national defense contractor. So I've um, I, I've done a little bit of this in my career, and this, these are the things that I've seen um, that I that I've seen that not only are they the most important in my mind, um, <clears throat> they're also some of the lowest hanging fruit. There's some of the easiest things you can do to to drastically minimize your chance of exposure. And also it's some of the things that I've also seen whenever I've worked with other people, um, especially different uh, different coworkers, different companies. These are the things that people tend to not do. And just performing these basic minimal tasks will protect you and save you so much uh, heartache and trouble. So there will most definitely be something on somebody's list who's in this audience today that I will have left out that you will consider needs to be up there. I totally get that. Again, this is all kind of based on my opinions and my experience. However, if there's something that I don't cover and you have a question about it, please feel free to ask it in the chat. Um, we're going to get to all chat questions at the end of the talk, just so I can kind of flow through it. And if I get through it, you know, with enough time, I'll stick around for as long as I can to answer questions. So feel free to ask questions at the end. And if you have any questions about anything in the chat, ask questions about it. But if there's another security based topic that you have questions about, ask it. I can't guarantee you that I'll be able to speak about it um, because I may not know anything about it, but I will do my best. So anything, any questions you have whatsoever, I'm always happy uh, to help. And good morning and hello to all of y'all that I can see in the chat. So it's great to have people here. So number 10, I would say is use a virtual private network and use a VPN. Um, VPNs are essentially a secure service or a secure, uh, yeah, I guess I would say call it a service or a secure tool that you can use to connect directly to a secure set server. And then that basically becomes kind of a gateway to either the internet. You can use a VPN to protect your information and your data when accessing the internet in broad. That's what will be known as a full tunnel VPN. So that means that you would connect to a secure service using a secure, um, uh, not protocol, uh, application or protocol. There's, there's a lot of different VPN providers. And then you would either full tunnel. So everything you sent would be sent through that VPN. And this kind of protects you because the VPN can ensure that these connections are secure. Um, the VPN can also uh, you know, make sure that it might have its own DNS setup. So maybe it's using DNS security. So that way you're, uh, you know, you're not getting, none of your data is being sniffed by your internet service provider or anyone else. Um, in typical, it's good to use virtual private networks for these kind of things. Um, you can purchase VPN support. So there's plenty of pur purchasable VPN supports for protecting yourself um, like in general or like or for a company, like you, if you want to use it for your company or you can set one up yourself, you know, a full tunnel VPN is when you access everything. But a lot of times if you're using a corporate VPN, a full tunnel VPN is really resource intensive. Now, like not only now do I have to route stuff to my corporate resources, but everything else has to be routed. So like to all other traffic. And so most of the time, most couple companies will do, I don't know, what is it called? A half tunnel? I'm, I'm blanking on that. Or a, uh, just a basic a full tunnel VPN is when you go to all traffic. A the other option I'm going to call it a half tunnel because I can't remember the name right now um, is essentially where the company uh, only routes the traffic through the VPN that goes to company resources. So whenever you tr whenever basically whenever you make a, a request, if I'm trying to access say my internal Confluence page or my internal GitHub or Jira, uh, my VPN router will or my VPN client will know this and will route it through the VPN. But if I'm going to something like Google or Netflix or uh, you know any other source, it will know, hey, this is not a corporate resource. I don't want to route this. So that's an option. And there are tons of options for VPNs. So 
WireGuard, OpenVPN, uh, OpenConnect. I've I've heard of Tink. There are so many uh, VPN providers these days. I I know WireGuard's been really popular lately. I think I think it got added like into the Linux kernel or something. It got added something big into Linux. Split Tunnel. That's what it's called. Thank you, JB. I could not remember the name of it. I was thinking Half Tunnel in my brain, but yeah, I split. I think Split Tunnel is the correct. Yeah, you're, thank you for that. Um, and uh, sorry, and Bradley, go Bradley ninety nine. Thank you for that. I could not. I could not remember that word this morning. Um, but yeah, so VPNs, I would definitely say, uh, are some of the basic things just to make sure that your network traffic isn't getting sniffed, that you know, you're dealing with all of that, especially um, because very all, more often than not, um, you will see, uh, you'll see resources internally that are not behind HTTPS, which is a no-no, but it happens. And if you're doing it over open internet, that's bad. Tip number nine that I have, um, uh, I would say they're called VP VPCs and isolated networks. So VPC is a really good, um, is it is a is basically sends for virtual private cloud. It's a really good service, and essentially what it does is it kind of creates a private data center for you. Um, and what this means is it, it creates a, an isolated network that you can put services and databases, servers, all sorts of things into, and they now can speak to each other over a private network. So a 192.68 address, a 10 slash eight address. Um, yeah, they can speak over those two. There's actually other ones too, but I don't, I think it's like a 172, but I don't think you're technically supposed to use the 172 space. Um, I think it's technically still reserved. Um, but yeah, it allows you to do private networking. So that way you're not, you know, sending stuff through uh, the open internet. And like, it's like right now, if I if I had two servers in, in two different, like maybe I just, I stood up two servers, no VPC, they would have to speak to each other over, over the open internet. So all traffic would go out and in, and it could become, you know, it could become compromised. There could be somebody sniffing in the middle. We don't really want to do that. It's also like, especially if it's in a day, if, if your network configuration is really bad and it's not using uh VPCs, it's going to do what's what a hairpin. So it's going to go out to the nearest public router and it's immediately going to turn back in and go in. And that's that's a waste of that's a waste of hops that slows things down. Whenever you can do things with inside of a, an isolated network or a virtual private network, now everybody can talk amongst themselves. Um, this allows you to have services that, you know, they, that don't need to be on the public internet to not be on the public internet. Like my database doesn't need to be accessible on the public internet. Only my web servers need to access it. Why do I have a public IP? Well, if I put it inside a VPC, I can either take away this public IP address or I can use firewall rules to completely block traffic from the outside world. And then I don't have to really worry about um, about people, you know, attacking it from the outside. You know, it's still it's still technically if someone does compromise your internal network, you are you're kind of still in the same boat. But again, all security tips are about minimizing risk. Like everything's kind of like a it's like a like, like layers of an onion, like you just keep peeling them. It's one more thing, one more, one more defense. And the more you have them stacked up, the more likely you are to deter them at one point. So definitely use virtual private clouds. Um, and then also use isolated networks. Don't have development stage prod all in one VPC. Um, you definitely, I would put them in multiple VPCs if I was using VPCs and then peer them. Um, if I was doing this in a physical data center, um, then I would just use different subnets. So like I would do, like if my if I'm running a relatively small company, my dev environment would be uh you know a one nine two dot one six eight dot like one slash twenty four. My stage environment would be dot two, and my prod would be dot three. So I would use I would still isolate these things. You need to keep them apart because if at any point any of these environments gets uh, compromised, then you then you know it only affects tests. So like if test gets compromised and someone breaks in a test, that's bad. That's not good. But if everybody was in the same VPC, test now has access to prod, that's worse. So if everybody gets in and somebody somehow, you know, destroys the test environment, while that's upsetting and that's really bad, we have to take care of it, um, it didn't affect production. So it's not as high of a severity as if someone got in to, you know, test and then had access to prod and then took down all of production and actually stole production credentials. That would be bad. So... You would use the you. This is where you kind of use these developer environments, these kind of different stages, different subnets work for a lot of it. Um, whatever you really want to do with that, it's uh, it is it is definitely a useful tool that I would highly recommend utilizing. Um, this is called blast radius, essentially, is and it's a it's a concept kind of I've seen before, and it's keeping as much stuff separate as possible. 
So, uh, tip number eight, keep your software updated. <laughs> um, so many times open vulnerabilities that happen inside of security and inside of the internet happen because people did not update their software. The longer a bug exists in the wild, the more likely it is to be found. Now, that being said, these bugs could go undetected in the software for many years. Like we were talking about the Heartbleed bug, that blog, that bu blog, that bug in OpenSSL existed for years and was really, really bad. And it, it could have been who knows how long that bug was being exploited for. Because I guarantee you people knew about that bug before they before they started exploiting it. Or before they started, before somebody found it and reported it. So the longer it is in the wild, the more likely it is to be caught. Um, but the thing is, is that the software, they, the software teams are usually pretty good. Or if somebody reports these things, they update them and they patch these things. And you definitely want to keep them patched. So keeping your software up to date as much as you can. Now, obviously, like don't change to versions that are like like ch changing to a version and breaking stuff immediately is not a good idea. That's this is why we have test environments. Um, so, but if you're using software that's you know ten years out of date, if you're using software that's no longer in an LTS and no longer supported, so like uh, a great example of this is Python two. Python two is gone. Like if Python two will have no more security patches. Nothing support is over. We're in the realm of Python three now. And if you're still using Python 2 because you can't move, I mean, I kind of get it, but any security vulnerabilities that come out of Python now on Python 2, are I don't, I don't believe they're going to be updated. And this happens with a lot of softwares. So you need to keep your software up to date. The more up to date the software is, the less time hackers have had to spend time on it um, and actually like, figure it out so it's less likely they'll, they'll find uh, bugs. And you just want to always be up to date with the latest versions. Now, that being said, as I see in the chat, um, it is also, you know, latest version also sometimes can cause bugs. So you kind of have to have a compromise on this. Um, I would definitely say that whenever I was doing stuff, I always kept things intentionally one minor version behind. So whenever I was uh, building Python containers for uh, Expedia Group, I the the base image, the, because I, I built the base image, the base image was always one minor version behind. That gave time for anything weird that kind of popped up. Like if something, if some weird security vulnerabilities popped up in say 390, that gave us a little bit of time to worry about mitigating it. But at the same time, it kept us new enough. So you kind of, you do have to find a balance there. I would definitely say that. So thank you for bringing that up in the chat. I appreciate it. Um, you can also just, you know, in Ubuntu, you can use unattended upgrades to uh, make sure that things are constantly being upgraded and you can choose the different Debian packages. So instead of like, you know, you don't have to do this for everything. This doesn't have to be like you want to upgrade every package ever. Um, Ubuntu has a security packages section and by, tur by uh, turning on unattended upgrades and then you, I think you edit an XML file and you say, hey, keep me up to date on all the latest security patches that will keep you relatively safe. So Next one, use firewalls. Use both external and internal firewalls. I highly recommend this. Um, you need to be using cloud provider and OS uh, firewalls. So DigitalOcean and most cloud providers offer a firewall. So that way you, you kind of have like the software defined firewall that happens at the cloud level that you don't pay for, that you don't have to deal with any of the, uh, the resource intensiveness of coming through it. And that's totally fine. Uh, however, Again, if you're doing stuff inside of a VPC and you don't have, you can still have firewall rules defined, but it's also a good idea to have rules defined um, on the droplets or on the servers to make sure that other things aren't happening. Because the thing about security, and most of you will probably have done this, is it's it's about hedging your bets and making sure if one thing fails, we're not it's not over. So by only using external firewalls or only using internal, so only using like either cloud, sorry, I keep bumping my microphone, either using cloud provider or OS, you're if one of those two fails for some reason, now you're completely vulnerable. By leaving both of them on, um, then you're, you know, if you leave both of them on, then you're good, or you're you're better off. I'm not gonna say you're good. You're no, you're ne like we can never 100% guarantee that things aren't going to be compromised, but you're better off with the more security you have. So you want to use these things uh, to regulate traffic both between to your servers, so clients coming to your servers, and then between your servers. Um, so you need to make sure that you're not you. It's because. Things happen, like botnets happen, stuff starts talking on your servers and stuff. I'm going to go over that in the next one. Um, and you need to be able to regulate that traffic. So, yeah, that is tip number seven. Tip number six is 
When you can use key-based auth, use key-based auth. Do not allow password-based authentication if you can. Um, password-based auth, like, and I have another talk that I'm going to do in January where I'm going to talk a lot more about social engineering. And it's going to be another tips talk on, you know, how to keep yourself safe from the world and the internet. But um, when I worked at a sec when I worked with my security at the security company in, my, in the beginning of my career, the number one thing that like we that we talked about was is it was the in insider threat and like you know it was focusing on the human factor. Um, breaking into some of these so like this software is only getting more secure. I mean, there's new bugs coming out every day, but you know software is getting secure more and more secure every day. And pulling off some of these very complicated exploits are are difficult, and it takes a certain level of skill. Um, guessing some like social engineering someone and guessing someone's password is actually a lot easier. To, I mean, with tech people, I would say that most of us tend to be better at passwords. I would like to hope that most of us are better at passwords, but they don't need a tech. They need like a manager. They need like an office assistant. They need anything. Anybody's password could potentially help them. So um, if you can avoid using password auth, avoid it at all costs. Like now, don't get me wrong. I know that that's not feasible. I know that you have to use password auth in a lot of things, but if you can use keys, use keys, especially with open SSH. Um, in my mind, I can think of, I cannot right now at this point in time. And if you have a reason in the chat, feel free to bring it in, but I cannot think of a reason why password auth should ever be allowed in SSH. Like if you're, if you're doing something in, in, in production, you should be using keys in the story. No questions about it. Um, SSH keys tend to be more bits than a password. Um, you know, I typically make my, my SSH keys are like 4,096 bits. And they're built on strong encryption algorithms. And even strong encryption algorithms, like I think like, like we know how to crack RSA, but RSA is still relatively large enough that it's difficult, very difficult without, it, without custom hardware to exploit RSA. But there's many other uh, uh, keys now, the uh, ECDSA25 something. That I, yeah, there's like a lot more uh, strong encryption algorithms. So it makes, it makes compromising these keys um, through brute force, nearly impossible. Now, if you leave your desktop unlocked and someone comes up and steals your key, that, that's, again, that's the human factor. The technology there did not fail. The humans failed. Um, and I love talking about human human factors and stuff because most of the time you'll see that most compromises are based on human failures. Um, establish a zero trust network. So I've seen this a lot. I've seen this at a lot of companies. Um, just because you're in the network, like just because you managed to make it in does not mean you should be trusted. Um, if anybody remembers a couple months ago, there was that large Twitter hack where a lot of the verified accounts uh, tweeted out about doubling your Bitcoin. I think it affected like Elon Musk, Bill Gates, a lot of people. Um, this was a social engineering attack to get into the company. And then once they, once they were able to get in, to that area, there was little to no protection because they're like, oh, well, if they've made it this far, they're trusted. A lot of the internal tools didn't require authentication. So they they don't have a zero trust network. And so you need to be authenticating at every step. Yes, I know it's painful. I know it's irritating to authenticate at every step of the way. Um, been there, done that. I've very often, you know, been, oh, I wish I didn't have to do this. Why can't I just have root to everything? Why can't I just, why can't I just get in? And that's, that is also just, just very difficult. Like, sorry, I lost my train of thought. I have to stop watching the chat because I read the chat and then my brain goes, boop. Um, so just don't, don't, don't have a, don't just let any, anybody, just because you're in my house doesn't mean you have access to my, my vault. Doesn't mean you have access to my closet. Doesn't mean you can go snooping around everywhere. Think of it that way. Your network is your house. Do you want everybody who walks into your house to be able to access everything? Probably not. Come here, Mr. Clicky. Um, don't be a castle with a moat. This is a great analogy. If you think about, uh, you know, there's there's a great analogy of like, you know, you have a castle and then you have a moat and you have a drawbridge. And only the certain people who are allowed can get over the drawbridge. And then once you're in the castle, you're kind of in. And that's exactly what that's exactly what a what a non-zero trust network is. It's where I'm in the castle, I can do whatever I want. I'm in my house, I can do whatever I want. No, you definitely don't want to be that way. Multi-factor authentication is a must. When we have zero trust, we don't trust that just because you got your password right, that you're that you're the right person. Um, you need to have multi-factor auth authenticated on everything that you do. If you're building internal services, you need to MFA it and you need to use it. It really does help. Um 
it, it, it it's, 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 it's a must. These days, with the amount of fraudulent stuff that's going on, multi-factor is a, is a big thing. And then that kind of leads into the, this tip number four, which is also, they, they, go, they go hand in hand. So a zero trust network and then establishing principles of least privilege are basically a hand in hand kind of thing. So basically, least privilege is you don't get more than you need. No one should be able to directly access SSH in his root. That like like I hate I've seen this at so many companies and I hate it. Um, if you don't need access, you don't get it. No one needs root access directly into root. You can have pseudo access, but audit being able to audit what's happening and who's logging in and doing things, you don't want direct SSH root access. And I've gotten, and doing wrong, I've heard every excuse in the book. Well, it's just easier. Well, it's not really that big of a thing. There's only three people that have it. I want to run four loops with SSH and do in bash shells. And if I use a key, I, if I use Zudo, then that breaks. I've heard every excuse. Um, I will, uh, I will 100%, I will never agree that people need to be able to SSH, SSH in directly and as root. Um, in production systems, okay? If I'm running a test server or I'm running like my personal website, actually, you know, with all my sites, I still set up a, a useful language, a useful, um, I still set up a, a uh, good grief, my brain is off today. I still set up a user, um, but no, no one needs root. Sudo is a great tool and there are others. If you use OpenBSD, there's like, there's like do as and stuff. Um, Sudo can serve both as a gating mechanism and an intrusion detection system. Um, you can use sudo if anybody tries to use sudo that's not in there. You can totally set it up as an alarm alarming system. Um, you just need to be using it to make sure that people aren't there. You need to be able to audit who did what on your system at all times, especially if you're into like PCI compliance, SOX two compliance. As soon as you need servers that are in a certain language, or sorry, as soon as you need servers that are in a certain like type, uh, security classification, you're gonna have to be able to audit it. Um, and that's just the thing. So this applies to applications. This applies to, uh, yeah, applications and APIs also, not just users. So whenever I deploy microservices inside of my company that are internal, those should also be off. Those should also be behind HTTPS. Like I should have to have a key to access these services. If I'm, if everything's happening in an insecure system and everybody's just talking HTTP and, you know, the user information system is internally, once you get in, is, you know, anybody can curl it and anybody can get into it and, you know, you can get you can get data out of it. That's not good. You need to have least privilege. Um, and I will say that it is a comp it is a compromise. Um, and I know that a lot of people don't really like it sometimes. Like it, it, one thing that bugs people more than anything else is not being able to access the things they need in a easy and efficient manner. And I get it. It happens all the time. Um, but security is about... It's a, it's, a, it's a balancing act between am I secure enough that I'm not going to be compromised to where can I still use the system? Um, because in reality, the most secure machine on the face of the on the face of the planet is a machine that's unplugged. Okay, that's like security top of the line, uh, locked room unplugged. That machine's not getting compromised without you know, you know we can say we'll put it in a vault you know without a blowtorch or a plasma cutter. Um, but that machine that system is completely unusable. Versus I can just put everything on the open internet and everybody can access it. Well, that's the easiest thing on earth to use, but it's the least secure. And it's a balancing act between the two, always. Um, have your backups, have them both on-site and off-site. Um, and a backup that's never been restored is not a backup, it's a prayer. Because the only time that you ever try to, when it, like when you get to that point where you need to back up and you've never actually tested that you can restore the system, you're essentially just praying that you got it right. And that's the best bet. I've seen a lot of people and a lot of companies that never tested their backups and then their data their data gets corrupted or stolen or something and they it's gone because they never actually tested up the uh, tested the backup. Do not rely on a single entity to take care of all of your backups. That is a single point of failure. Um, so do not rely on a single cloud provider to do backups for you. Like everything can fail. You should, you should go into the mindset of computers in general that everything can fail and break at a moment's notice. We have basically computers are really stupid rocks that we zap with enough electricity to make them do magic and make, make lights blink essentially. That's a really silly way of putting it. But always assume that there's failure. Never, if, th if this data is super critical to you, 
do not rely on a single place. Find a way to get it out and have it in a backup. Even if you don't like do it on a normal basis, even if it's like a, like you know you do backups more frequently on site, but then you do an off site backup every month or so. Yeah, you might still lose some data in that, but you're not going to lose everything. So always make sure that you're uh, that you're not tied to a single point of failure for this, because it it will whenever that single point of failure fails, um, things tend to cascade and fail together, and it's it's amazing how it does. With the advent of ransomware attacks, this is more important than I think than ever. It used to just be now that like, you know, your data, you corrupted your database, you need to restore it. Maybe somebody got in and, you know, dropped your tables or something. But ransomware attacks are happening where they're just encrypting your data and they're like, I want $100,000 in Bitcoin. Give me, you know, give that to me or you're never seeing your data again. And, you know, with ransomware attacks, you have to be able to have backups. And if they've gotten into your system, they're going to do a lot. These these are sophisticated attacks. So always have backups both on-site and off-site. Um, so audit your services. Number two, um, it's 10 o'clock. Do you, what, do you know what's running on your server? I used to see those commercials as a kid. Like, it's 10 o'clock. Do you know where your children are? Um, it's 10 p.m. Do you know what's running on your server? Do you know what is running on your server? Do you like you you think you know you've deployed stuff, but do you know if maybe you've been you've been exploited and there's a small botnet running there? Do you know if you're mining crypto on there? A lot of these botnets and crypto miners just get put on there, and people never audit. Um, people never audit their stuff, and that's how these things go on forever. People don't check and make sure that things are happening, um, and what's going on. Lack of auditing leads to botnets and crypto miners. And these things go undetected for years. And, you know, that's how this kind of stuff happens. You can use uh, SS-Plunt, P-L-U-N-T. It's a simple one just to see um, just to see what outbound services are running on your machine. Like, well, who has outbound TCP connections? Like, and let me see it because it's useful. Um, you can use all sorts of other tools. We used, uh, we actually used to run server spec tests um, every like 15 minutes to make sure that like the correct ports were open. Like it was, it was actually an audit system and a rectification system. We ran these server spec tests to ensure service X, Y, and Z was running. Ports were open. Firewall rules were engaged. That the system was running, but at the same time, if anything came back that was not in that list, it served as an auditing mechanism as well. So you definitely want to use. You definitely want to audit, and you can use. There's lots of different tools. Um, I will say that personally. In this space, this is one of the few, I don't know a lot of the open source tools in this space. Um, we use the server spec system and I actually kind of liked how it worked and we never, I never really uh, got out of there. Now, tip number one, um, I know a lot of people are like, well, what's he going to put his first, you know? And trust me, countdown lists are probably some of my opinion, they're some of the most fun, but they're some of the most difficult uh, talks to write because no one's ever going to agree with my order. But in my mind, tip number one is sanitize your inputs. As my mentor used to tell me, um, always assume that the person on the other end of your site is a malicious jerk who's trying to steal your kittens. Um, and that's cleaned up a bit. So the the XKCD Bobby drop tables is 100% there. Um, it's really interesting because I, I practice computer security very differently than I practice interactions with humans. I usually try to assume the best intent with humans. Like, I want to assume that people are good. I want to assume that, you know, people don't, like, you know, maybe maybe it's Hanlon's Razor, if you've ever uh, heard of it. Um, like, I, I, I assume good intent until proven otherwise, because I, I like to believe in the best of people. Um, when it comes to dealing with people who are touching my servers, it's the complete opposite. Every user is a malicious user. Every user is trying to get in. And you should treat them as such. Not so much as where you ban them from the platform, but where you don't trust their data. You don't trust what they're sending you. If you've got an open form field, you need to be sanitizing your inputs. The amount of, like, the fact that SQL injections are a very old attack. Like, it's, this is, like, we're talking, like, these are not, this is not, like, a new kind of attack that came out a long time ago. We've been talking about SQL injections for a long time. Um, and the fact that there's still a very relevant part means that people still haven't really learned the lesson that you can't trust people inputting stuff into your system and you gotta you gotta treat every you gotta treat all traffic as malicious traffic until proven otherwise um and even then sanitize it you know it's the in there's like the oh i think it's i think it's an old russian proverb it's the trust but verify and that's completely backwards for so computer and for computer engineering it's verify then trust um 
Trust but verify is not a good, not a good, it's a good methodology for humans. It's a terrible methodology for computers. So yeah, that's my number one tip. I know a lot of people probably may not agree with that being number one, but so like misconfiguration of servers and stuff happens, but usually people get it right. There's a lot of modern things in the world now, but the amount of times people just leave themselves open to an SQL injection or an, any sort of injection. I've seen more LDAP injections than you than my career than I've ever I ever care to want to see. And that just terrifies me because that's all user info. That's all secure user info. So those are my tips. Thank you. That's all for this time. Um, be sure to be on the lookout for more DigitalOcean webinars and workshops like this one. Um, if you like listening to me talk personally, I my webinars are typically on the uh, they're on the last Thursday of the month. So you can, you can typically tend to see me then, um, you're not going to see me in December because I think that the last Thursday of the month is almost, I am pretty sure that's like almost around Christmas, maybe the day after Christmas. I think Christmas is on a Friday this year. I think that's Christmas Eve. Um, so you won't see me in December, but I have one coming up in uh, November and in November, I'm actually going to be doing a live coded webinar where I'm going to be going through SSH in depth because I guarantee you there are a lot of features in SSH that many of you may have never seen that you can do some really cool stuff with and do some really cool security things with. So I'm going to be using SSH doing like an in-depth dive in SSH. Um, Hacktoberfest ends this Saturday, October 31st. So if you are participating in Hacktoberfest and you want to either get your t-shirt or you want to plant a tree to help the world, or you just want to do a, you want an excuse to do some open source maintainer work or open some open source contributions and, you know, help out with the community. I mean, one, I encourage you to do that year round. But Hacktoberfest ends this Saturday, and we really hope that you'll do it. Um, if you're new to DigitalOcean, feel free to try out my link at do.co slash Mason for $100 free credit for 60 days. And the last thing I have is D DigitalOcean is having its own community-driven uh, conference. Now, there's going to be some talks by DigitalOcean people. There's going to be talks from people from our community. It's going to be a 24-hour stream of talks from Tuesday, November 10th to Wednesday, November 11th. It's called our Deploy Conference. I personally will be speaking about DigitalOcean's new project, our new platform, uh, app platform. And I'll be doing a uh, live coded tutorial on how to use um, DOCTL, which is our command line tool to uh, deploy applications. That's going to be really fun doing a lot of automation stuff with that. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoy... Um, I hope you enjoyed this talk. I hope that if I forgot anything, or if you have any suggestions, please put them in the comments. I'd love to hear what your opinions are. And maybe like, maybe you don't agree with everything I have. Maybe there's something that you think is more relevant. Would love to hear that. Um, I can happily sit around for a little while to do the questions. So I'm done. Um, yes, magic voice in the sky. Are you there? Or should I just read the questions? I can just read the questions. Let me scroll back up to the top and I'll read the questions in the chat. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see everyone. How trustworthy, first question, how trustworthy are those no log policy VPN providers in your opinion? They could still sniff on your traffic and not just tell you. Ooh, <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, you can trust a company. Yeah, you. It's your choice if you want to trust them. Um, I have heard. I can't. I'm not going to say which VPN because I don't want to get in trouble. Um, but I have heard of some of these VPN providers taking the traffic that they have, and then right around turning it and selling it back to the ISPs, which is a hundred percent what we were trying to avoid in the first place. So, how trustworthy are they? They're as trustworthy as you think they are, and as they say they are. Um, typically, when it, people catch this kind of stuff. And people know, so if they have a reputation for being trustworthy, I guess it's okay. But in my like, the only way to have one that you know 100% that isn't being mined for your data is to set it up yourself. Some of them are trustworthy. I I, I know a few that have a good reputations. Um, some of them I know turn around and sell your data right back to the people that you're trying to keep it out of anyway. So now they may anonymize it so that way they can still, which I guess, you know, that's if they anonymize the data and they don't know what's coming from you, then maybe that's okay. But you're right, 100%. A VPN provider could pretend to be a VPN, say they're secure, and 100% sell you out and sniff your traffic data. So, um, yeah, do it. Yeah, but it's at, the, at that point, you have to, you have to make a personal judge call. Um, I actually, no, wait, does this still work? How does it? Oh, come on. Okay, we used to be able to do this. I used to be able to click on the, the questions and they would show up as. Um, they would show up in the thing here. I'll have to, we'll, we'll have to get that working for next time. So uh, I have a question. This might be off topic. Do you have any reference link for me to learn optimized Linux server? Um, 
mm, I don't think I know anything off the top of my head, but uh, for how to optimize Linux servers, but I would, I would bet that there's a tutorial on it on DigitalOcean's community, so I would check that. Um, woo, yes, WireGuard is in the Linux kernel now. That's awesome. Uh, anyone have any references or a book on how to get deep into VPCs? So in my opinion, VPCs are not a top, uh, so question, sorry, I, I kind of mumbled that. Anyone have any references or books to get deeply into VPCs? Um, VPCs are actually very, very simple. Or, um, uh, they're, they're, they don't have a lot of knobs. Like you set one up and you're kind of done. Now they get more complicated in other cloud providers. DigitalOcean's VPC is setting up a network and having that there for you. Uh, like, so really and truly to understand how to use VPCs, you need to understand the fundamentals of networking. So you need to know how, pri how IP, how IP addressing works, how, uh, what the difference between public and private IP addresses, WAN and LAN, like understanding, having like a, an IT perspective of like how to set up a network and how to configure a network, DHCP, DNS. Now, the likely is you're not going to need these in VPCs, but that core fundamental understanding of networking, then you're just going to learn that VPC is just a magic tool that gives you access to a lot of these things. So I don't know any like references. You can check the DigitalOcean documentation on VPCs, but there's, there's not a lot of like bells and whistles to VPC. It really is, give me a subnet. That's very much what it is. And um, so yeah, go with that. Uh, best way to get VPCs to create, tear them down. Yes, I agree. Um, just, 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 just play with them. Um, okay. And VPCs, I believe are a free option at DigitalOcean. So I don't think you have to, I don't even think you have to pay for it. So if you did want to spin them up and tear them down, you could. Okay. Questions, questions. How does it, okay. So question, how does it affect if our software is not the updated one? Um, I wish I'd remembered the context around that. Uh, if you still have that question, put it in the chat and I will read it in a second. Actually, I'm going to move this over here. So I'm, ah, it's not what I wanted to do. I should stop sharing my screen first. Then I can move this over here and now I can talk. Uh, cool, cool. What do we have? Okay. Uh, is a fi are, is firewall more than just a set of rules for blocking ports? Depends on the firewall. So a cloud-based firewall, yes. A a very basic firewall in Ubuntu or anything else, yes. There are things that are known as like next generation firewalls, which do classification. Um, you can sometimes hook up your firewalls with uh fail to ban and things like that. So that way, if too many attempts come in from a certain thing, you can ban them and rate limit them. Firewalls are, are at the essential, the core of a firewall is a, yes, it's very much just a very dumb thing that like, are you allowed? Yes, no, go away. Um, there are advanced firewalls that you can set up. Um, I, again, the, the first cybersecurity company I used to work for, it used to have a next generation firewall pro process or project. And it did things like classification and all of that. And it was really cool. Uh, uh, this webinar will be available on YouTube later. There's a cyber attack tomorrow. Not to my knowledge, but there probably will be. Like this question says, there is a cyber attack tomorrow. Um, I know of no cyber attacks, but that, that there, there are, there are, hundred, there are. I would, I will take a random guess. There are hundreds of thousands of cyber attacks every hour. Um, if you ever so. I don't, well, I don't always recommend this, but go check out your, uh, your, your, if you have a server, go check out your SSH logs on the public internet and just see how many people are just banging against the server, trying root and password and stuff. Just try, go look, go see. You'd be surprised how often people like bots and stuff just scrape across the internet and try to log in. So there are cyber attacks. I guarantee you there's thousands of them happening in a second. So probably more, I guarantee that number's higher, but I don't want to be like 11 billion. Um, but yeah, I guarantee you. How do you audit pseudo actions on a Linux VM? Um, if you're going to audit pseudo actions, you definitely are going to log it, and then you're going to want to rsync it off the box as quickly as possible. Because I used to get in, the dis the, the agreement the disagreement that I used to get into with coworkers was if I'm if I can pseudo in and I can pseudo as root, then I can delete all the logs that told you that I logged in. And the answer to that is yes, you can. What you can't do, however, is if you pseudo in and log in, and you're immediately rsyncing your logs off or you're streaming your logs off to another box. 
you'll get in and you'll be able to stop that service relatively quickly, but the likelihood of you being able to stop it before it gets to the system is, is low. Um, and then we'll see that you logged in and then it suddenly stopped working. So we'll, we'll know. So you want to be able to just check logs and stuff and then get them off the box. Do not, do not rely on your logs being on the box because if the, if the attacker compromises the box and they can compromise the logs and the logs are useless. So you need to have them streaming. Uh, Splunk is a great resource. We use Splunk a lot. You, you can, you can R-sync them if you don't want to use Splunk. Um, but yeah. Uh, SSO solves that for the most part. Yes, if you have the option to use single sign-on, use single sign-on. Not everything um, supports single sign-on. Uh, but yes, if you can use SSO, SSO is yet another yet another uh, thing. But I mean, it's still a two-factor authentication. It's still a multi-factor off um, because I still have to click a button on my on my phone uh, to do it. So okay, Mason. When it comes to security, non-sanitized and Puts are the SPOF of SQL injection. Single point of failure of injection. Okay, that's what that means. Okay, and I was like, SPOF, okay. Yes, totally. Uh, let's see. Thank you everyone for, for coming. I would, I'm would. i really happy that everybody's here. Uh, okay, so I'm finally getting down to the bottom of the questions. When is the SSH talk the event or is there a link in the docs? Um, it looks like the, my, the magic voice in my ears uh, already linked to that. So that's good. Where do you get the presentation? Uh, this presentation is hosted on the tech talks page. The next, uh, the next one will also be there. Do you suggest to use fail to ban and a firewall or just a firewall? Um, it depends. Uh, uh, I like fail to ban personally, but tweaking fail to like, you you can potentially lock people out that don't need to be locked out because it, it could take time. So like I I think that any well we'll go with it this way. Security is in layers. Security is in pieces. Firewall is one. Firewall fail to ban is two. Two is better than one. It works. So I would use fail to ban. Um, but there's also I know there's other tools like some of those also some like again some of the next generation firewalls do auto banning for you and have rules and stuff like this. Um, but yes, if you are getting spammed by a malicious IP address that's like trying to SSH in every thirty seconds or just constantly like like attacking you or yes, banning them outright will help. So I always recommend do, taking as many precautions as you possibly can. Which is my choice: UFW or IP tables? Uh, I don't like I don't like IP tables. Um, I use UFW when I when I need to and like because I don't I don't set up complicated rules. UFW is great for getting started. Um and it rewrites a lot of things and I would definitely say that if you can use it go for it. Um I've but you could do I mean you might be able to do complex things uh with with uh UFW. I've never really tried it, but I know you can do crazy stuff with IP tables. Um at my first job the device that we built was a security hardware um device. It was a, it was a server that you would put in your data center. It would monitor traffic and make sure it would do threat protection, web security, email, like, uh, scanning, all of that stuff. So, um, I've seen some amazing things done with IP tables. Um, personally, I, I come from like the BSD land and I love PF. I think PF is like one of the greatest firewalls ever. And I wish it was, I might even be available on Linux. Um, but I don't know. And then someone in the chat says, use APF firewall. I haven't even heard of APF. That's actually one of the things that really irritates me is that there's a lot of firewall technologies. And I'm like, just, just standardize on one, please. It makes it like whenever, if you want to do any consulting work whatsoever, you have to know like six different firewall technologies. I mean, you kind of, you know how they all work with the the, the, the syntax. Ugh. So uh, are there, okay, that's all the questions that I saw in the chat. Are there any more questions? Do we have anything more from anyone? I'm happy to answer questions on, any security related topic. We can talk about Hacktoberfest. We can talk about deploy. I've got Sammy right here behind me so he can say hello. So Sammy can say hello. Whoop, whoop. I will stay on for another, we're going to say minute. If I don't get any more questions within a minute, I will, uh, we're, we're, we're going to go ahead and call it. <sighs> Why no IP tables too complex? Um, so IP tables is complex. And I would say I've seen a lot of people mess it up. That's why you, it's kind of why these other tools were created. UFW, I think Fedora and CentOS have like firewall D 
Um, a lot of times, a lot of these tools that are built are actually built on top of IP tables. Like I think UFW runs IP tables under the hood. I know Firewall D does. Um, and it's because IP tables is it's an old tool. It's a powerful tool. It's a strong tool. Um, and I, I ha like it's a good one, but it is complicated. And if you 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 can mess it up, it's, I would say it's easier to mess up. And if you mess it up, you could leave yourself, you know, open. You could lock yourself out of a tutorial or sorry, out of a server. I've locked myself out of many servers, um, and it's not fun having to get them back. So I don't. Uh, so if you like taking the time to learn IP tables, you, if you need to do complicated network stuff. Um, then you should use it uh, like because it, it, it is great at what it does. But if you just need that, you just want people going in, you want to have SSH and HTTPS open, use UFW. There's no reason to go into complex IP tables rules when you can, when you only needed the basics. Yay. We're getting more questions. Um, how to be secure with ports. Uh, only open the ports you need. <laughs> Don't let, don't open the ports. You don't, don't leave everything open. Like if you, if, if you're only running an HTTP server, don't open another thing. Because again, that's again, botnets, like they can come up, they'll open up something on a port. And if the firewall is letting it in, there's a connection in and you're in. Now, usually botnets dial out. That's usually how they work, but sometimes things allow, want things to dial in. It happens. Um, that's why you should also set up your security, like per, uh, well, yeah, you should set up your firewall to do only allowed only allowed outbound connections on established connections. Um, for like web servers and stuff, because you only want the server responding. You don't want somebody to be able to dial out. Uh, that does kind of make updating your software a little bit difficult sometimes. I think you can add an exception rule for that. But yeah, there's there's a lot. We I could do maybe I'll do a talk on firewalls. Like it seems like there's a lot of questions about firewalls. Um, We're getting a lot of them. So, what a distro is my favorite. <laughs> um, I love BSD. I love free BSD. I love open BSD. Um, unfortunately, I haven't used them in years because with the way modern development's been going with stuff like with Docker, I don't need them. However, I would say FreeBSD has the most advanced networking stack of any of the distributions. Um, Netflix uses FreeBSD for its edge routers, I think, and they contribute actively backup stack. And then the freebie, I've, I've seen presentations that were like, this is how you get, you know, two terabytes per second out of a NIC at, at once. And I'm like, what? So there is some advanced networking stuff in FreeBSD. Um, I'm going to be honest, I'm a Red Hat fan. I like, I'm, I'm a CentOS Fedora fan. I use Ubuntu because it's the, like in my talks and my presentations, because it's the most common um, and people like it. And it's, it's okay. I just don't like apt. I'm a, I'm a Debian and RPM fan. Um, I like the, I like yum and DNF. I don't like apt at all. Um, also I, you, in my first job, I had to build, uh, uh, packages. Like I had to build RPM packages and those were actually relatively simple. Debian packages confuse me so much when I try to build them. So for those reasons alone, I like Fedora and CentOS better. Um, uh, Secure though any articles related to open ports. I guarantee there's a tutorial about ports and DigitalOcean. Could you please recommend a penetration test service or test security of mice? Ooh, there's usually two tests. Ah, ooh, I don't know of any services. I don't know of anybody. I don't. I don't like. I know of a few, but I don't know if it's appropriate for me to shout out them. Um, Google it. You'll find really quick, really good ones, really quick. I would say. Um. Yeah, yeah. I don't have anything else for that. So I'm sorry about that one. Um, your thoughts on changing ports from some level of security to 22 to 223? Uh, so that's what's known as security through obscurity. And there is a big debate in the security world. Um, there's obscure. Anything that helps helps is one side. And then the other thing is obscurity is not security, which I tend to lie on that side. However, with the caveat that anything that helps helps. If you are only relying on obscurity to secure yourself, you are, mm -mm. but if you have other things in place, like, you know, I, I've seen people that like will obscure their, like they will, they will leave hard coded passwords in a, in a, in a, in a, in code, but to obscure them, they just take the hash as a, like a very weak hash that can easily be recalculated. Like, well, it's obscure. Most people look at that and go, Oh, I can't get that. 
obscurity only gets rid of the the, the weaker people, um, the, the the less determined people. Changing it to two twenty two thirty three um, will probably help you because uh, it'll eliminate a lot of the bot traffic, so that will help. Um, can I explain honey honey pots in my SSH talk? That's a good idea. Ooh, I thank you. I love that idea. Maybe I'll do some honeypot stuff. Um, if you got a YouTube there, what security measures must be taken into account to allow for external tool like a CI to connect their SSH? Just keys. Just give it a key. Um, most of your CI tools are know how to do it, and you just you create a key for them, and you give the CI tool like Jenkins the key, and it can SSH in. Uh, do I have any recommendation antivirus for Linux servers? I do not. I I thought that was the whole point of Linux is that they didn't need it. Uh, yeah, CI support SSH keys today. Is session keeping security up to date with ports? Uh, I'll talk. I'll do. You know what? I'll do a firewall talk. We'll talk about ports. Ports are not like like. There's not really much to talk about ports. Open the ones you need. Close the ones you don't. There's really not that much else to it. Um, well, establish connections. Yeah, I'll talk about. It. I'm gonna do a firewall talk. It's a great idea. Thank you. Uh, malware scanners. Not aware to it. Glad that people are enjoying it. Honey pots. What is your opinion of TPOT? I don't know what that is. A Python automated machine. Whoa. Tree-based pipeline optimization tool? For a data science assistant? No idea. If that's what you're asking, I have no idea. I'm not a data scientist. I, co I come from systems. Um... Oh, that's scary. Yeah, Teapot looks like it's coming up a lot of automated machine learning stuff. I have no idea what that is. I'm actually going to take some notes because I need to take notes for this because we're going to do a... I'm going to take some notes over here. Do a firewall talk. Do a firewall talk. Cover honeypots in SSH talk. Okay. Okay, sweet. Teapot honeypot. Okay, sorry, my bad. I, I'll, you know, I know nothing about it. I'll have to look it up. Um, using non standard ports helped us a huge amount, especially for SSH. Yes, it does help. Like, because a lot of the attacks that are happening on you are going to be automated. Um, most of the time, people are, so by non, by using a non standard point, it will help you. Um, and if that, if you're dealing with a lot of traffic, like I, I used to run, a home server when, when I first got started, it was like an Optiplex 755, just enough virtualization to run Hyper-V. Um, and I ran like a BSD server, I ran like a free BSD server for my web server and I, I gave it like 128 megs of RAM because I was curious how much RAM I could get away with. And I actually used to get DDoS by people, or not, not even DDoS, DOS by people trying to SSH in and like so many of them that it would just bog down my network. Um, yeah. Yes, so it will help. It will help. But if that's your, my, I guess my, my point to that is if that's your only means of security, it's bad. Like you need other means of security. You need to have firewalls. You need to have all the other stuff. But yes, it will help. But security through obscurity will get, well, it will deter the people that are not determined. And that's really, really and truly, that's all security is. That's all the, having security in layers is, the same is the same reason why we have locks on doors. If you've ever watched, there's a great YouTube channel that I love watching called The Lock Picking Lawyer. And basically every lock in the face of the planet is pickable and he can do it in about two minutes less. So locks on your door are in reality a deterrent. They are not actually a security mechanism. Um, they are, they are, they don't, they're not like, they're not foolproof. They, if someone really wanted to get into your house, they pick the lock, they break down the door. Um, they deter most people. And that's what security measures are. Firewalls. Oh, I can't scan this. I'll go somewhere else. SSH rules are like, you know, trying to get it. They, each one deters some, the next and next person. Obscurity does deter people. Like, you know, if I was just, you know, say I was a bad person. I'm not, but say I was. And I'm skimming around and I'm looking and I see someone's key in, uh, in a random repository on GitHub. And it's, it's obscured. I'm like, okay, well, okay, it's obscured. It doesn't work. I'm out. That's that's too much time. Someone who really wants to get in will spend the time to crack that. We'll spend the time trying to try out the salts and stuff. Um, so, yeah. Um, but, yeah, so you, you'll go with that. And then you just got to do a lot of stuff. And then in here it says, uh, I guess you're suggesting more whitelist than blacklist. Yes, you should have, and you should do, like, 
more of an accepted list. Like your, your accept list should be, you should always go with an accept list model. You should never go with a deny list. Like it, it, default deny. It's a, it's, um, mm, I think so. And this is where, this is where I, why I like PF and FreeBSD. I think IP tables may have changed their policies, but it's a default deny. By default, nobody's allowed in. Whereas by other, some other things, default, everybody's allowed in. And that's the bad one. Default, you let people in and you have an, you have trusted sources rather than trying to block all of the bad sources. That list will get way longer <laughs> than you can possibly think than the default allow list. So yes, very much recommend using a oh, allow list or a trusted sources method rather than a deny list because a deny list will... It, it, it'll take up several gigs if you if you try to terabytes of data of text if you try to uh, deny all of the bad users 100 percent my opinion security should always be default denied permission should always be default denied the answer should always be no until you give me a reason to say yes that should always be how security is done in my mind um but yeah And I think we're good. Uh, magic voice in the sky. If there's any last questions, I can stay on for another five minutes. I have till technically 11. Um, but yes, yes, you can turn policy on IP tables. Yes, I does IP, I, for people in the chat, is IP tables a default deny or default allow? I thought it was a default allow, but it might be a default deny. I don't remember. Again, I don't really use IP tables that much. I use the little bit of UFW that I do. And if I do a lot of, um, if I do a lot of, uh, like if I'm doing a lot of crazy network stuff, I'm using FreeBSD and using PF. So, how does a researcher use Shodan? I don't know what Shodan is. Um, let me Google it. Oh, it's some sort of the search engine for Internet of Things. Ooh, this doesn't look pretty at all. This looks. Is this a, is this a device that's scanning for open Internet of Things devices? Uh, yeah. A uh, personal YouTube channel, actually, I I do. Um, I don't do a lot on my personal YouTube channel, to be honest. Um, but you can just look me up. It's Mason Egger. Um, if you want, I, let me go back to this real quick. <laughs> Or we're going to go back. This is my contact information. Uh, follow me on Twitter. I post a lot on Twitter. Um, I also do live streams with coding um, on Twitch. So twitch.tv slash coding that coding with Mason. Um, and yeah, so if you want, if you want to see more of me, if you want to come in and chat with me more, I love chatting with people. Um, I Twitch, I stream on Wednesdays at Mondays and Wednesdays at four o'clock central time. Cause I'm based out of Austin. So uh, yeah. That'll be good. And I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. I'm, I'm so happy that we had a really, we had a really engaged chat today. It's really fun talking with everyone. Be on the lookout for my next talk. We're going to do some SSH stuff. Um, and yeah, I'll, uh, I'll look into doing, I'll look into including some honeypot stuff with that just for the fun of it. Maybe that'll be like the last 10 minutes of the talk, like a little bit of fun honeypot SSH stuff. It's interesting. I've, I've had friends turn on honeypots before and you'd be surprised like how people, um, on how people, uh, on the passwords that people try to use default. So thank you again, everyone. Uh, magic voice in the sky. I am done. So you may, you may take it away. There's a, there's a person that moderates everything and I, I call her the magic voice in the sky. She, she takes care of me. So.